a, that plane is put through lots of different tests, and they also do a rejected takeoff, where they take the plane up to 200 miles an hour, and I've seen this on video as well, uh, on the runway, and then they put all the brakes on to the max, no reverse thrust in case that had failed. They're testing whether the brakes only can deal with it without then everything catching fire because of the heat that's generated. And um, engine stalling in full flight, that's a good one, isn't it? I don't think I fancy being on board at that moment, um, but obviously the test pilot does it and um, finds out whether it will cope or not. And clearly it did. But a plane has to be tested thoroughly in order to discover how it performs, discover its qualities, discover its limits, discover whether it can do what it's designed to do or not, whether it's reliable or not, all those kind of things. And I've called today's message, Testing, Testing, One, Two, Three, just to try to give it a memorable title for you. A couple of weeks ago, Al spoke to us out of Exodus 16. And that's a situation where the Israelites have been in the wilderness. They've come, come across the Red Sea and um, they are been in the wilderness for a couple of months or so. And there's no water and there's no food. And they grumble. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, you may remember. They grumble against Moses um, and God then provides them with manna and quail. And in an amazing way, they have supernatural provision of food, morning and evening, actually for 40 years. And bearing in mind there were probably 3 million of them at the time of the crossing of the Red Sea, this is a massive miracle, as well as a very, very long-lasting miracle. We can tend to forget that um, as we read the passage. And what God was teaching them was that he's teaching them a daily dependence on him in that whole experience. In Exodus chapter 17, we're going to read some of in a moment. They've now been in this desert area, having crossed the Red Sea for two, three months maybe, something like that. And uh, we'll pick it up in Exodus chapter 17 and verse 1. The whole community, the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, walk on ahead of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you at, by the rock at Horeb, strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Just imagine yourselves, trying to think yourself into the situation of the people of Israel who have been in this place where there was no food. God has then provided them with food, but it was clearly not a desirable place to be as they had to, there was no kind of food to eat and they were hungry. And then the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, which remember has been leading them and continues to lead them uh, throughout their years in the wilderness, the pillar of fire moves. I would imagine if you were one of the Israelites, you'd probably be quite relieved. Thank goodness we're moving on to somewhere better than this. And so they follow the Lord. It says the whole community set out. And that's important to note. No one was left behind. And as we seek to be prepared for the journey that God has for us as a people, together, our heart is that no one gets left behind, that we're all on journey together, following as God leads us. And they go from place to place, the scripture says, as the Lord commanded. And he was leading them very closely, specifically with the pillar of cloud and fire. In other words, they were exactly where God wanted them to be, as we are. But for them, being exactly where God wanted them to be, their next discovery is, but there was no water to drink. That doesn't seem to add up, does it? God's leading them very clearly and specifically. They're following, going wherever he wants them to go. 
but there's no water. Now, the region that they were moving around in, in this wilderness area, was not like the Sahara Desert. It was not a place where there was no water. It's an area that the commentators describe as somewhere where there are scattered springs of water. So there are places where there is water, but God chooses to lead them to a place where there is no water. That seems a strange thing for him to do from our perspective, and no doubt from the Israelites' perspective as well. They've got their daily manna and quail. There could have been water, but he's taken them somewhere where there isn't any. What's he on about? What's he doing? What's he think he's doing? Where is he? Where's he gone? Is he still with us? All these kind of questions that the Israelites were asking. And so they quarreled with Moses. And in fact, it's again, because they've quarreled with him before in the previous chapter. This is the second time in two chapters that they've done that. Even though Moses had said to them when they quarreled with him the first time, actually, you're grumbling against God, not me. Your issue is with God, not me. Do you realize who you're grumbling against? And yet still, they do it again in this scenario that we've read this morning. It seems like there was somewhat of a blame culture in the community of Israel. Now, you can understand and have sympathy with them, in a sense, because it's pretty extreme. You find there's, no, there's no food, there's no water. That is tough. And yet, when they complain, Moses accuses them of, testing, of, of grumbling against God and testing God. It strikes me that we live in the UK in a blame culture. And we see that around us in all sorts of levels of society. I'm not, I'm not trying to comment on, commentate on the rights or wrongs of this situation because I don't know the detail, but it does concern me that when there is a severe incident in the Grenville fire, that our, many of our society are looking, it seems, for someone to blame, and that there is a danger, and I, I say I don't know the details, so I'm not saying what's right and wrong, but there is a danger because of that attitude that we can feel coming through some, some sections of society of people who actually were doing their best in setting the rules as they did on behalf of the fire service at the time, in, within their knowledge, that they're going to get blamed for something that wasn't anything deliberate or negligent, actually, but was something that they didn't do very well. Now, I say, don't read what I'm... I'm not trying to make a comment on the rights and wrongs, but yeah, I'm just trying to paint the picture. You get what I'm trying to say. There's, a, there's an attitude there. And we don't want to be like that as a church. We don't want to absorb a blame culture. We want to be the opposite of a blame culture, actually. We want to be an honoring culture where we lift people up, where we honor and esteem and value other people, uh, both around us, within the family of God, but also anybody who's born on the face of the earth, who actually bears the image of God as a human being. We also not only want to have a culture of honor, but we also want to be authentic. And one of the things that as I was thinking about this, I thought, you know what? I need to be authentic with you for a moment, as well as honoring you as the people of God. And the authenticity bit is the tricky bit. And that is to say that I have become concerned that our, over the weeks it's become a bit of a pattern that actually more than half of us often aren't here when we're ready, when the time has come for us to, to worship God together. And, and that's not great um, because there's a danger of not honoring God by coming together ready, willing, you know, at the right time to, to express our worship to Him together. It actually does affect the way the meeting is and the effectiveness of our worship if we're not all here at the beginning. You can understand that, can't you? Um, and it's not honoring to the people who've prepared to come early and get ready and so on either. So I want to put a bit of a challenge out to us and say, do you know what? I think, wouldn't it be great if we were to say, actually, nine times out of ten, we're all here on time. And there will be occasions, of course there will, when there's a reason why it just something happens and, and it upsets the apple cart and, and, and we're late. And that's going to happen and that's okay. But you get my drift. So I'm trying to be authentic here. I'm trying to honor you, that we honor God, that we honor one another, honor those who've prepared. But also, let's be a bit real and say, come on guys, we can, we can do this. So please hear that in the spirit that it's intended. 
the Israelites quarreled with Moses because there was no water. And Moses says to them, why do you put the Lord to the test? And the first lesson that we get out of this passage is that although they had followed God, they, he, they were exactly where they wanted him to be, they find there's no water. The first lesson is this. Things don't happen always the way we want or expect. They just don't. And that may well be, it will be, your experience in life one way or another. It will be. The question, the challenge for us is, how do we respond when that happens? For some of you, this message, although it may be hard to hear, is actually a really important one to make sure that you do not, your faith does not get torpedoed in the future. There used to be a, a Christian song that was quite popular, which I was a very naughty man and changed the words to, which you're not strictly supposed to do. Because there was a line in it that I was not willing for us to sing because it was wrong. And what it said was, and in your presence, all our problems disappear. Now, one day in eternity in his presence, that will be true. But the essence of what was being conveyed in the song was, become a Christian and all your problems will disappear. Be a Christian and all your problems will disappear. Not true. Not true. If you think that is true, and then you do have problems, that could be a torpedo to your faith. Because you think, the basis of my faith has now been shot to pieces by this difficult thing that's happened that I wasn't expecting and wasn't wanting. A book has been written by Andrew and Rachel Wilson, which will, The Life You Never Expected. And I totally recommend this book. It's a very, very readable paperback and their experience has been of um, having, giving birth to, to, to two children, both of whom are severely autistic. Now, that's very challenging. I believe the eldest one of them is, is about 10 or 12 years old now. Now, that book will be of huge encouragement to those of you who have any similar sort of experience in life, but actually it will be a huge encouragement to all of us because it tackles the questions of not just specifically finding that in the family you have a, a particular need in an individual, but rather more generally, what ha when, life, when things happen that you just never expected or wanted in life, how do we respond to that? How do we understand that? How do we deal with that? Now, what's God's first response to the people of Israel's grumbling and complaining? His first response is wonderful. We read it in verse 6. Strike the rock and water will come out of it. And it says, and so Moses did it. What the passage we just read doesn't say is exactly, well, what happened then? But if we look elsewhere in Scripture, we find it described. Psalm 78 says this. Describing this very scenario, he split the rocks and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. Isn't that amazing? Now, remember, we're talking here about enough water for three million or so people to drink. So it needs not to be just a tiny little trickle. It needs to be a lot of water. And it's described as, as abundant as the seas. There is a huge supply, a massive sort of gushing flow of water that comes out from this rock when Moses strikes it, as God told him to do. And there's a message in that, of course, which is do whatever God tells you to do. The second main lesson that comes out of this is this. Nothing is impossible for God. Nothing's impossible. He called the place Massah, which means testing, and Meribah, which means quarreling, because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, and this is what the, the, the verse 7 of the psalm says, is the Lord among us or not? That was their questioning. That was their doubting. Their attitude, capital A, towards the situation they found themselves in was such that they ended up questioning whether God was even with them. Despite the fact, remember, they have manna every morning, quail every evening, supernaturally provided by God, and water flowing from... Sorry, no, the water came later, didn't it? And the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud is what I was meaning to say. 
leading them everywhere they go. They've already got those things, and yet they doubt whether God is with them. And the passage for me causes us to ask ourselves the question, well, do we kind of sympathize with them, which we can, because they're in a, a really tough situation. There's no water. We can easily sympathize with that. On the other hand, we can ask the question, well, was it okay to grumble against God, to test God in that sense? Because God's first response is to say, it's really hard, here's a load of water. Maybe he didn't mind that they were grumbling against him. But Psalm 78, a little further down than we just read, tells us otherwise. Verse 18, they willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they crave. They spoke against God, saying, can God spread a table in the desert? Verse 21, when the Lord heard them, he was very angry, for they didn't believe in God or trust in his deliverance. So lesson number three is this. It's not okay to test God, to put him on trial. Deuteronomy 6, 16, Moses spells it out in words of one syllable by saying, don't test the Lord your God as you did at Massa, referring back some years later to the incident that we've just read. Psalm 95 says this, Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as you did at Massa in the desert, referring to it again, where your fathers tested and tried me, though they had seen what I did. In other words, with the manna and the quail, pillar of fire, and so on. So there's a clear message that it's not okay to put God on trial, because what it's doing is it is doubting his character. It is questioning his goodness. It's questioning his faithfulness. It's questioning things that he has actually promised to be with us. Jesus was angry with the Pharisees, wasn't he, when they refused to believe despite the evidence of all the miracles. And when he was tempted in the desert, the the devil says to Jesus, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for he will command his angels to guard you so that you won't even strike your foot against a stone. And what's Jesus' response? Verse 12, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. See, it betrays an attitude, this putting your God to the test. It's it's this word test, it means to scrutinize, to examine thoroughly. It's rather like a jeweler who is examining gold to assess the quality of it. And uh, the Bible's making it really clear. No, don't put God on trial. Don't examine, scrutinize, look to give your judgment on God as to whether he's good or not whether he's right or not, whether he's, Judas, whether he's true or not, whether he's faithful or not. Don't put God on trial. Whoa, who do you think you are, really, is kind of the tenor of it. So God was actually angry with the people, it says, when they were doing that. They had this attitude, capital A, if you like. So when things don't happen how we want or expect, we don't test God and put him on trial. The question that the Israelites were asking was, is he with us or not? And if when we have tough stuff happening in our lives and things that we didn't want, things that you didn't expect, let's make sure we don't fall into the trap that the Israelites did of saying, well, is God with me or not? Because that's to doubt his word, the one who said, I am always with you. That's what Jesus said even to the very end of the age. We could be tempted to say, God, when things are tough and going wrong, in our estimation, well, do you love me? The Bible says God is love. The Bible says, talks about the unfailing love of the Most High. That's actually a theme of the Psalms that you might like to research later, the unfailing love of God. You look up that phrase and and you'll find lots of references. We might be tempted to ask God, well, do you care or not? Psalm 116 verse 5 says, Our God is full of compassion. My uh, dear mum is coming up 93 now, and she's, she's suffering. Life is very, very hard for her. And uh, she has to have 24-7 care because of that. And... Every time I go to visit her now, she says, Peter, why doesn't the good Lord just take me? Because that's where she is. And I don't really have an answer for that. 
other than to say, Mom, you can still pray. And your prayers are as effective as anybody's. But her mind is such that that's not easy for her or meaningful to do a lot of the time. But when we find ourselves personally or others dear to us facing kind of things we, never, we did not want or expect, how do we respond? That's the challenge. How do we respond? And the first lesson of, the big lesson, if you like, the big first big lesson or two today, the first big one is this. When stuff happens like that, we don't put God on trial. We don't do what the Israelites did. We don't doubt him in those kind of ways. We have a, a cat at home called Tilly. And um, Angela loves Tilly. I'm not quite so keen, but we keep Tilly. And uh, she's always in the house at night. The other day, she, well, another night, she was out, and so I needed to get her back in before we went to bed. And at bedtime, she has, we always give her a few biscuits. Now, she'd already had those, and so now she's outside. We've given her the biscuits. How am I going to get her back in the house? So there's only one solution, which is to put a few more biscuits into a, into a little container, open the back door, rattle it, you know, and, and then thinking, well, and there's no response for quite a while. And then after a bit, I hear rustling in the trees some distance away, and then the sound, the unmistakable sound of the cat claws on the fence, and then rustling through the bushes, and then choo, she sprints across the garden through the back door to get her six little biscuits. What's that called? Cupboard love. That's not what God wants from us. He wants something so much more. He wants love that comes from the depths of our hearts, whether he gives us our biscuits or not whether things happen the way we want, unexpected or not. He's wanting to produce in us a quality of relationship and love with him that goes far beyond a cupboard love, that loves him regardless of life circumstances and what life throws our way. The Bible in Deuteronomy gives us God's perspective on the scenario in Exodus. The Israelites' perspective was they're testing God. Is he still with us? You know, they're questioning him. God's perspective is very different. Read in Deuteronomy chapter 8. This is Moses speaking to the Israelites many years later. Remember, he says, how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you. Aha. Uh -huh. In order to know what was in your heart whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger. That's a tough one, isn't it? And then feeding you with manna. Verse 5, Know then in your heart, that's what God wants for us to know today, that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Verse 16, He did this to humble and to test you, so that in the end, it may go well with you. See, the Israelites thought they were testing God. God's perspective was rather different. Actually, he says, I was testing you to see what's in your hearts. And the reason I'm doing it is because when I test you and train you, I'm, uh, there is the opportunity for faith to grow in your heart of a quality that wasn't there before. That as you exercise faith and trust in me and discover my goodness and my faithfulness, so your faith grows. The quality of your heart faith increases. And that is going to be for your good. So that in the end, it may go well with you. You see, God always has our good in his heart. And that is the faith point this morning. To believe that that is true. That whatever life throws our way, my mum at nearly 93, just not knowing why on earth she's still on this planet, actually to still say, but I trust God. And we prayed together when I was with her this last week, just saying, God, it's, 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 our times are in your hands. That's when the crunch comes, isn't it? Times like that. So lesson five is this. It is okay for God to test us, and it's always for our good. It's always for our good. We always need to understand Scripture in the light of Scripture. 
And I, as part of my preparation for today, have been checking uh, Hebrew and Greek in some resources and, and materials that I have in the Old and New Testament to just make sure that we... Because if you can identify, which you could do for yourself, look these things up, if you can identify where the same Hebrew word or the same Greek word is used in different places across the Scriptures, then that helps to give you insight into what the actual meaning is, and it sort of fills out our understanding and makes sure that we're understanding it correctly. Proverbs 70, 17 verse 3 says this, A crucible for silver and a furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. Genesis 21, God tested Abraham in his willingness to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice, which he prevented him from doing at the end. But Abraham didn't know that until God told him not to, he didn't have to. And God's response to that test was, now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. Some years ago when we were considering buying this very building that we're sitting in, we had had potential opportunity to purchase it as a church community. Uh, we had got ourselves ready. We had a pledge offering to be able, have we got, can we gather the resources necessary? Um, and that was a wonderful pledge offering. We put in an offer, and the news came back. You haven't got it. We're outbid by property developers. And uh, I went and had a little conversation with God and said, Lord, what was all that about? It felt like you were leading us, and then it didn't happen. And it was one of those rare occasions, and it would be great if it was every day, where God replied really clearly and immediately. And he said, Peter, it's my prerogative to test my people. Consider Abraham and Isaac. And I kind of took a step back and said, yes, Lord, I, 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 I hear that. It is. Of course it is. And that's borne out in the scriptures. In Exodus 15, um, it says in verse 25, at Marah, there he tested them. God tested the Israelites. Exodus 16, uh, 4, about the manna and quail. In this way, I will test them, God says, and see whether they will follow my instructions, which was to pick up enough they needed for each day only. Exodus 20, which we'll look at um, in a couple of weeks' time, God appears in thunder, lightning, and smoke, and Moses says, God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. So again, it was a positive thing. It was for their good in the end. We can read in, what, in the New Testament some similar kinds of scriptures. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, two verses from verses 6 to 7. In this you greatly rejoice, Peter's writing to a company of people who are suffering from persecution. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. All kinds of trials. Notice that. These have come so that, what? So that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and positive outcome for your good and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So again, there is purpose in the trials. These all kinds of trials have come but it's for a reason. It is to prove, to prove in the sense like gold is proved, refined. It's to prove, to refine our faith, to show that it's genuine. In order that also then, in the end, it's for the praise, glory, and honor will be revealed. That is both the commentators say praise, glory, and honor for the Father and Jesus and for his people. So there's reward for us in it. Even if there was no reward for us in that, it is sufficient, isn't it? that our exercise of pure, loyal faith in God results in praise, glory, and honor to him who is worthy of all praise. That's what our life is for, ultimately. It's to live for his praise and glory. We want to bring him the highest praise, don't we, in the whole of our lives. I need to rush to a finish. Can I just say this? What I'm saying, it does not mean that all hardship comes from God though clearly he has allowed it. There's a th different subject to go, that one could go into there that obviously is not the subject for today. What we do know is that everything works together for the good of those who love the Lord. Romans chapter 8. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.20, If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God, to this you were called. Interesting. Chapter 4, verse 19. So then those who suffer according to God's will, ooh, that's an interesting one as well, should commit themselves to their faithful creator. That's what we do. And continue to do good. 
So there are times when God does test us, but it's always for our good. You could look up Hebrews 12, 7 to 12, which talks about the same thing. It says, later on, however, this discipline from God produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. Again, there it is, for our good. But notice it's for those who have been trained by it. And that image is of a horse that accepts and is trained by the bit that's put in its mouth. And we as Christians can be those who fight against the training and the discipline of God, like a horse fighting against the bit. Or we can choose to be those who accept it and respond with a good heart, who resist having an attitude, capital A, that accuses God, and rather have a heart that is of submission to him and say, well, Lord, you're sovereign. I'm going to keep trusting you whatever. And that's my encouragement to us today. I'd like the uh, musicians to come back up, those of you who are going to, please, because I'd just like us to take, just, just take a moment to pray whilst they're getting themselves ready. And we're going to finish by singing a song, which I'll just read some of the words of to you now. Just be praying in your heart and beginning to talk to God about your response to what's been said this morning. I appreciate the fact that it's a, a, a tough message to hear in many ways. But I think it's an important one. It will, it will prevent, protect some of us from the potential torpedoing of our faith when we realize that actually all our problems don't disappear until eternity. But in the meantime, whatever happens, we put our trust in him. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, bear in mind that the writer of this hymn wrote it soon after he'd lost his wife and children who were drowned in a boat. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. When Satan should buffet, when trials should come, let this blessed assurance control. Whatever my lot, you've taught me to know. It is well, it is well with my soul. Do you know that it's well with your soul as I finish? If you're not sure whether you're a believer, a follower of Jesus, if you're not sure whether you've received the salvation that he offers to us freely on that cross, then I'd love you to do two things. The first is to take one of these Why Jesus booklets from the information point at any point. that You're welcome to do that. There's no charge for those. And the second would be just to, to meet me in the foyer a bit later and say, Peter, yeah, that's me. Because I'd love to be able to chat to you and help you on your journey to finding the truth and the reality of knowing God and the joy of serving him and knowing him and loving him for yourself. Shall we stand together? And we're going to sing this song to finish. <laughs>